This is the closing panel for the day. It's an effort to kind of bring together the different threads between the plenary presentations, the breakout sessions, a lot of the hallway conversations. Uh, for many of us in an older time, the way we used to measure the success of the conference, of course, was the number of business cards we'd left with. I guess you know, what we'll do is we'll pull all of you within 24, 48, 60 hours to see how many of you have added X number of people to your Facebook pages uh, as part of this sort of new mode of keeping track. Uh, we have been charged, as you can see from the, the title of this panel, What's Next? Bold Predictions, Cautionary Notes, and Takeaway Lessons. Uh, to make some bold predictions, to be grounded in some of these predictions. And uh, both for the panel as well as for all of you, I should add a word of caution. Anytime ask, somebody asks you to be bold, it's a great opportunity to either be incredibly intelligent or to, over the period of time, two weeks, six months, two years, because of the digital detritus that follows all of us, uh, to look incredibly foolish. But this is a very wise panel, and my guess is that we will look good and sound right today as we will over time. Let me begin with some very brief introductions. I'll follow with a little bit of context and we'll go right to the panel. So to my left and your right, but that's a statement of geography, not politics. And I have to be careful about saying that in Ohio, I guess. Um, and that too was a joke, it didn't work. Uh, and I grew up in Cleveland, so anyhow. Ann Helmer is the director of the Baker Nord Center of Humanities and, the, and an associate professor of art history here at Case Western Reserve University. She's a specialist in Victorian art, has published on various aspects of garden design, landscape painting, as well as issues related to women artists and representations of women. She's currently engaged in two major research projects, one examining the relationship between art and science in 19th century British painting, uh, the other investigating the rise of the speculative international art market in 19th and early, early 20th century London. Phil Long, to my immediate left, again, that's a statement of geography, is the Associate Director of the Office of Educational Innovation and Technology at the Massachusetts Institution, uh, Institute of Technology, and Phil leads the outreach effort and projects that emerge from the MIT iCampus project. He's responsible for the research and evaluation of innovation innovative uses of technology in MIT education, particularly undergraduate education. His research focuses on designing learning spaces to support active learning. He is a lapsed biologist and behavioral ecologist. He studied birds off the north slope of Alaska. And Phil is leaving us. Uh, he's heading for Australia, some might say a far better place, to establish a new lab at Queensland University in Brisbane in fall 2008. Uh, Michael Shoup is, was appointed president of, of the Metropolitan Campus of Cuyahoga Community College here in the Metropolitan Cleveland area in May 2006. Uh, his current interest is in the economic and technological forces reshaping the landscape of higher education and how the emerging model of teaching and learning can best serve students, faculty, staff, and members of the larger community. He holds a PhD in the English language and literature from the University of Maryland. Corey Anjaka is the co-founder co of Second Life, the hugely successful and award-winning virtual world where he architected the core code and hired the team responsible for Second Life's growth to over 12 million residents. Uh, he's currently a visiting professor at the Annenberg School of Communication at the University of Southern California and an authority on the development and the use of virtual worlds in gaming, entertainment, education, government, military, and business education. He's a graduate of the United States Military Academy, where he completed degrees in both weapons and engineering and computer science. We are glad to have you as a civilian, Corey. Naval Academy. Naval I'm sorry. Ooh. <laughs> Ooh. Do not be getting that wrong. Naval Academy. It was an error in the text, all right? Uh -huh. It was probably written by an Army person. Probably written <laughs> by, by an Army person, right. And Mano Singham is a fellow of the American Physical Society. He's currently the director of CASE's uh, Center for Innovation in Teaching and Education, USITE, and an adjunct professor of physics. In 2001, he won the university's Carl Whitkey Award for Distinguished Undergraduate Teaching, has received numerous other awards for his work in undergraduate education. His recent research interests are the areas of education, theories of knowledge, physics, and philosophy. And all this group, of course, is a very distinguished panel. You can find longer bios on the website. Oop, I missed the pictures. My apologies. Okay, I mentioned earlier in the opening plenary panel, we are in the third decade of this technology revolution. Each decade has had a defining technology. We've gone from cute and convenient to compelling in the diffusion of these technologies, and then from compelling to compulsory. We have great aspirations. We confront the issue of assessment and accountability. We're gonna focus on some of these, these, these conversion experiences and our aspirations reach and grasp. How much do we reach for? How much is our reach in, in line with our grasp as we talk about these technologies? A little bit of context as well. Um, 
we have had these great aspirations, and yet we know the diffusion of these technologies over the last 15, 20 years has been very slow. These data come from the campus computing project, tracking the use of tech, various kinds of technologies, the percentage of classes that use email or internet resources, have a website for the course, com use computer simulations or presentation handouts. We can see, again, two decades into the so-called IT revolution, email seems to be almost ubiquitous, but not completely. The numbers have risen slowly. Another metric of this slow uh, curve, slow, uh, long tail, if you will, is the deployment of learning management systems. We know that these no, almost all campuses have an LMS, Blackboard, Moodle, Sakai, Desire to Learn, Angel. Uh, but the deployment, again, has been slow, and also the deployment has been uneven. While we can get some metrics about the percentage of courses or classes that use an LMS, we don't know how deep and sophisticated the LMS deployment has been. Has it been just a tool for faculty to put stuff up on the web? Are the more interactive and engaging and the sticky components of that LMS being used? Again, one of the questions we don't know, what we do know is, again, this long tail, slow tail of deployment. And finally, the last slide, the whole notion of Web 2.0 comes to campus at the macro level. As in the past, a lot of the innovation has been sparked by individual entrepreneurs who've been attracted to these technologies, some of whom are with us today, saying, I want to bring these technologies into my classes, into my courses, into my research. Often the institutional infrastructure lags, and we see that again in the slide here. Tremendous variation in the percentage of campuses as of fall 2007, reporting a strategic plan for the notion of Web 2.0 or the technologies. And then when we get into some specific examples of this, a campus page on Facebook or MySpace, these numbers are quite low. A presence on Second Life, uh, with the exception of public research universities at about a third, the numbers again are running about 15%. Many campuses are essentially doing the, the equivalent of uh, staking claims in Second Life, making sure that they own the island before somebody else gets it and uses that brand for other purposes. Uh, and then also the, the numbers about a public wiki, highest in public research universities is about 20% deployment numbers lower. Phil, I'm gonna turn to you as an advocate for this at MIT and somebody who scans broadly. Help us map this landscape in terms of where we are and where we're going with these kinds of technologies. Well, now to paraphrase the, the, the William Gibson quote, the future is here, it's just not evenly distributed. Mm -hmm. We have places uh, in data from institutions that are more aggressive with respect to these technologies from, for example, the New Media Consortium's member survey, which shows um, in-house in hosted wikis being uh, in the order of 34%. Uh, relative to uh, to the broader s landscape of institutions. So I think there's a lot of, of experimentation going on. The real transition is around interactivity. Most of the technologies that you were describing earlier um, are various ways to efficiently broadcast. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think the, chan the transition that's taking place is a recognition that with these new technologies, we can actually get to a point of scaling an apprenticeship approach to teaching that um, that we've always wanted to do, I think, and never really had the opportunity to do. Uh, and this notion of scaled apprenticeship allows for large-scale classes to interact in um, different groups in different sizes, but nevertheless uh, using various forms of, uh, of interactive tools, the so-called Web 2.0 tools and the like, um, take advantage of those to be able to get the kind of in-depth uh, scholarly and, and sort of investigative aspect of building knowledge and scholarship that's, that we're trying to do. All right, and giving you a chance to get bitten three weeks, six months from now, which of the technologies do you think hold the most promise for, for the fostering collaboration and long-term promise in terms of making some significant change in terms of the way undergraduate education evolves? Well, I think there's a couple- Name names. A, a, <laughs> <laughs> name names. This is the part where you look really prescient or really stupid. That, well, not uh, now, but later. Okay. Yeah, maybe. Um, well, I do think that, that, that what we're going to find is with the larger scale of pressures on institutions, um, the virtual world technologies are going to be extremely powerful in the future because I think there's going to be other factors, $400 a barrel oil and things like that, that's going to make interaction and virtual presence um, a much more attractive approach to moving bits around. And ramping faculty up to be willing to use that technology in terms of infrastructure and, and feeling safe to and do this? And ramping faculty up into, to, to doing infrastructure is a matter of making the connection between what they're doing in their research life to what they're doing in their teaching life. Mm -hmm. the, the closer those become the overlap, because they're using these tools in their, in their daily uh, investigations anyway. It's just a matter of making the, con the transition of using those tools to what they're doing when they're going through the, the ports. Well, of the they class. may be using them at MIT. There's some evidence to suggest there are other places beyond the world of MIT. Really? No. Yeah. Um, <laughs> of course. And the, but the point is, is I don't think that there is um, 
uh, a difference in the notion of the pursuit of, the pursuit of knowledge and information. Mm -hmm. There may be different aspects and different points on which the focus is being placed, but ultimately I think the kind of engagement that you're using to get there is, is not that different. All right, which is great, because now we're going to test that. Michael, as the president of, of a metropolitan community college, Pardon? A, a campus. campus of a metropolitan community college in an area that is going through transition, shall we say? Fair enough. Metropolitan Northeastern Ohio. That's a world that's a little bit different than MIT. At face value, many would say that there's different priorities. Is that the, the kind of commonality that Phil described, is that an accurate assessment in terms of the, of the world at Tri-C metropolitan campus and the faculty? Well, at a surface level, short answer, no. Okay. Uh, because most of the faculty who work at community colleges don't do research. Some do, mm -hmm. but most don't. But they don't. teach. That, but their primary, yeah. I mean, at, at, at universities, it, you know, the, the, the tripartite is teaching research service. At, 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 at community college, it's teaching, teaching, teaching. Right. Right. If you do research, that's great, but if you're not a good teacher, you're gone. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and so, yeah, it is, a, it is a difference in emphasis, it is a difference in priority, and the notion of bringing your research closer to your, to your teaching when research isn't a, in a, isn't a primary motivation, isn't what drives rewards, isn't what drives recognition, is, is a little misleading. The community colleges have been some of the most innovative, often not recognized, in the area of online education, mm -hmm. in the wake of the sort of a, the rise of the web, the dot-com bubble, and some other kinds of things. Um, are they ready now to take that next leap that Phil described into Second Life as the platform for the delivery of, of that, that instruction? Well, I think some community, community college faculty, I, really. Uh, well, in fact, I think some community colleges are already, uh, are already experimenting with Second Life. In fact, uh, at uh, American Association of Community Colleges annual meeting last year, I led uh, essentially what was an interactive session, um, a sandbox right. environment with, with Second Life where I had probably uh, 30 community college uh, folks, most of whom were, were teachers, and uh, you were talking about uh, environments where people can be safe. It was basically a safe environment because they were just surrounded by colleagues and you know, no students looking on, you know, no, no administrator standing over, over their shoulder aside, aside from me, and it, all of them were going back to their respective institutions, so there was nobody to look in, in, uh, you know, inept and in, embarrassed in front of. Students in community colleges are very different than students at MIT. Most so it, so there's, there's two populations as we talk about some of this. Even as we talk about this conversation of a wired net gen, um, do those issues also play out with, with students in community college? They're part-time, they may have less access to these kinds of technologies, or they have less time to explore these technologies because of other commitments and priorities, work, family? Yeah, I, I think there's a couple things I'd say. One is that it's, it's important to remember that although uh, a, core, a core population that, that community colleges serves are folks who otherwise would not have access to higher education. Mm -hmm. uh, this typically means some, someone who is from lower income. This typically means somebody who is underprepared. Having said that, um, as you well know, having attended a community college, we serve an enormously broad spectrum of, of folks. Every, everybody mm -hmm. from uh, the folks who couldn't get any, in any, any place else or to the 19-year-old uh, prodigy. I mean, we at my campus, as an example, we have, we have, we have kids, and I will use that term, who graduate from high school with associate degrees. They have two-year degrees when they graduate right. from high school. Now, that's not a trivial mm -hmm. academic achievement for anybody. Um, and rest assured, every single one of those kids walks out, transfers with a scholarship in hand. We also have, have, have people who struggle through developmental ed education and just bar barely make it. Uh, so it's an enormous spectrum. But you're right, it is typically the case for a community college student that there are going to be many, many other pressures, including family and work mm -hmm. um, and the rest of their lives, um, most of which are a struggle. Mm -hmm. Corey, Michael talked about expanding access. In one sense, we, we could say that, in fact, Second Life expands access in some new and innovative ways. How do we carry that notion of expanded access into the education community? Right? We heard a little bit about this in the breakout. We've heard a little bit about this across the day. Where do we, where do we go with this in a realistic and a grounded and a safe way, both in terms of the institutional investment and the individual investment? So it's, I think it's interesting. We talked about this in the breakout a bit. Um, I actually view the academy as having led a lot of the adoption mm -hmm. of virtual worlds and the use cases for virtual worlds. Um, you know, starting basically with the Games Learning and Society Conference at UW-Madison in 2005, I believe, was sort of when there was a tip in academic adoption of Second Life. We've actually seen some of the most interesting uses have been 
academic institutions. So in, in one sense, I think the academy has, has been driving that expansion. Now that what you run into is you need broadband, you need broadband with all the ports opened and you know, not mid 1990s era computer security, um, and you need really high end computers. Mm -hmm. And those things, though they all get cheaper, still cost money and are still not uniformly distributed. So I think that as we go, go forward, all the trends are on our side, mm -hmm. right? Um, but trends know, over, over what, how, compared to the diffusion of other kinds of technology, whether it's Friedman's Netscape revolution, other kinds of technology, you know, how quickly Facebook, how quickly Second Life has ramped up to numbers. As so we talk about getting past the earliest adopters in both the student population, well, a student population, a faculty population, and an institutional infrastructure. Are we at critical mass? Are we approaching critical mass? When do we hit critical mass? When, when does it become safe, for, safe, comfortable, and attractive for civilians? Hmm. Well, so one of the things that makes the adoption of Second Life, I think, as successful as it has been, is it's been exclusively bottoms-up adoption. Okay. The people who have started using Second Life in classrooms or in other teaching environments are using it because it is a useful tool, right? Rather than having an administrator, not that they would ever do this, decide that you will use this, this sexy, cool new technology mm -hmm. and you will figure out how to make it useful in your classroom. Instead, it's being used in a way that makes far more sense, right? For, for the people who it makes sense for, they're already beginning to adopt it. And more importantly, their knowledge of how they are adopting it and what has worked and what has not worked is being built into the uh, educator mailing list. It's being built into artifacts within Second Life itself. And so there's a great deal of knowledge production that's happening around the act of using Second Life for knowledge production. So we have a very good recursive building environment mm -hmm. for getting better at doing this. There's still this cutoff, though, in terms of who has access to it. I think the adoption curves for new computers and more broadband are, are moving in good directions. Will Facebook always be more accessible than an accelerated 3D interactive product? Of course. Mm -hmm. Most cell phones can access Facebook today. You know, we are you know, somewhere in the five to eight year time frame from most cell phones being able to ac access an accelerated 3D space. And so, you know, I think in that sense, of course, there are limitations. Um, however, comparing the capabilities of what you can use Facebook for to what you can use the whole web for versus mm -hmm. what you can use Second Life for is in some senses a little bit silly, right? They, they bring right. very well, different Madeline, capabilities. Uh, let me switch then to Madeline. Bring, bring us from these extensions back in, because you've been looking at some of these issues in terms of access, resources, education. Uh, where, where do we go with this in sort of a, a real world sense of realistic expectations between the potential of the technology, kind of reach and grasp issues, whether they affect the world of MIT or the world of, of Tri-C Metropolitan Campus or the, the world of Second Life? I'd like to take it even broader than that. I mean, for me, the, the promise of Web 2.0 is precisely what Corey mentioned, this bottom-up um, adoption by people and using this technology to form links and networks and affinity groups to coalesce around issues that they care about and work towards. Mm -hmm. And I think that extends well beyond the academy. There is a role for the academy, but it extends well beyond the academy. And my personal concern and my hope and aspiration for these technologies uh, is the future of actually democracy. I mean, I, I think, to my mind, it should be fairly clear that political power, say, in the US has been sort of hijacked mm -hmm. by a fairly small coterie of people that spans both political parties. It's a sort of a, what some people call the villagers. You know, it's a collection of key political leaders, media figures, uh, publishers and editors of major newspapers and national TV outlets, the think tanks and opinion makers, the people you see on TV, the pundits and so on. And they sort of shape the national agenda. They decide what kinds of political issues we should care about, what range of opinions we should have, who are the candidates we should be entitled to vote for, and it's so on. And I should want to emphasize that this is not a sort of a cabal or a secret conspiracy. Uh, this is, is a group that sort of it itself is an affinity group that has got together and decided what, how democracy should function in this country. And what we see with all these people who are going to all these, you know, the, the uh, Tony Williams' thing about people's abandoning traditional things and seeking their own groups mm -hmm. is a sign that people are searching for alternatives to find a voice, their own voice, into the system. 
And I think that is what I think is happening, which is very interesting. And that's what Web 2.0 allows. And it is, now where does the academy functions? Well, we in academia have a certain privileges. We have time, we have access to resources, we have certain technical expertise, we have knowledge. And I think we uh, can play the role. We can take advantage of the fact that Web 2.0 has lowered the barrier to people becoming public intellectuals, to sharing their knowledge and their expertise with a broad public who can access that information and use it as an organization tool. So I think that's where I see this is going in, the, in education in a broad sense, not just in the academy, but in a broad sense. And that's my big hope for the future. Now, there are dangers. I well, mean, one of the dangers is we're creating a new, new set of digital elites in terms of, of the, digira the chattering classes and the bloggers. Well, I, I think that is not so much the danger. Uh -huh. The danger that I see is right now, there are limits in terms of the cost of access to the okay. system. And usually the way you control opinion is not by suppressing uh, contrary voices, but by, by raising the cost of access. I mean, I think we are fortunate. We are living at a time sort of like, which is the fortuitous combination of the pamphleteering age of, say, Tom Paine. Mm -hmm with the access that Tom Paine never had of reaching a huge number of people with these ideas simultaneously. Now, the danger we should uh, be aware of is people who are afraid of that participatory democracy in a broad sense trying to raise the barrier. And that's why I think things like what Lev is doing with One Cleveland is the way to go. And things like net neutrality should be guarded. Bringing down the barriers. Bringing down the barriers. and making. Uh, whereas there will be attempts to control that flow and in a sense limit once again and pigeonhole people so that they don't no longer have a voice in the system. So that's in a sense my hopes and my concern, my caution. And let me turn to the arts because we could argue, picking up on, on Mano's comments, we could argue in one sense that the technology has actually brought down the barriers to access to a lot of the rich visual media that in the past was not easily accessible. You know, the early uh, take on, on Netscape, for example, you get access to the Vatican Library. Now we see a lot of these Web 2.0 applications, whether it's, it's personal collections or uh, established and recognized museums. What's that future look like, short term and long term? I think it's a very mixed future. Um, I think that there are still traditional, going back to Mana's point about barriers, there are still traditional barriers that haven't been dealt with, like the notion of copyright in public domain. Mm -hmm. So those, those exist in a sphere, despite the notions of democracy, material is still owned by somebody and they can still can control access that way, what you can cite, what you can't cite, what you can download, can't download in that material that's not considered in the public domain. Now I know that's becoming an increasingly gray area, but you know anybody who's publishing on James Joyce knows that is that a very litigious area. Um, that scholarship has basically been closed down by the James Joyce estate. Despite how many scans of that material is available, right. you cannot technically publish it without permission of their estate. Well, even at the way, level of undergraduate education, Michael, I noticed you were nodding through this thing, the whole issue of, of college presidents and campus officials dealing with copyright mm -hmm. in terms of lower division undergraduate classes, yes. whether it's access to materials on the web or faculty understanding to you because it's on the web, yeah. let alone students. We're, yeah, I was actually less thinking less about the administrative issue of how do you deal with co copyright and more, uh, more, more about the larger point. Mm -hmm. The barriers aren't technological barriers, right. they're conceptual barriers. Right. Okay. That's actually the much bigger problem. The question you asked earlier, the pragmatic question is, what, at what point are these, in fact, the, the, the way you precisely phrased it, when does it become safe, comfortable, attractive for civilians? And the way I translate that question is, when do teachers actually adopt this? When does this become standard operating procedure in a, in, in a classroom? Whatever the this is. Okay? And, and I think the barrier to the adoption of any kind of technology, and I, you know, one kind of technology, the other doesn't really particularly matter to me, is the, the model we have in our heads of, of what a classroom is and what it does, and how durable the current model is. And there are reasons why it doesn't change. One of the reasons why it doesn't change is there are a few a, a few of us, I don't know if I'm one of them, but there are a few of us, maybe it's Mono is, who are really good at the current model. And there are a lot, a lot who are just, uh, just okay. And so changing to a different model means almost necessarily you're gonna be incompetent for a while, and we don't like to be incompetent. So that's a, that's a pretty big barrier. Um, there are also, frankly, generational barriers. Some people are just not ever going to be comfortable in a world they didn't, that they didn't grow up in and are, you know, it's, it's just not part of the, of the way they think and the, and, and the way they conduct business. Mm -hmm. um, 
and you, know, you, were ta you were talking about you know, two weeks out, six months out, two years out. In my view, the time horizon is 20 years, which is a generation. It also turn, turns out, and perhaps this is just a coincidence, but you were talking about Tom Bain, uh, Tom Paine and the, and the, and the, the age of pamphleteering. I, I think that maybe it'll turn out that the better analogy is the age of incunabula, you know, 1450 to 1500. We were figuring out what a book mm -hmm. is, and right. truthfully, the dominant technology still in higher education is the book, mm -hmm. or the pr actually printing. Not, the, not there, the book. There is the joke in the software industry about the reason God could create the world in seven days was because there was no there were no legacy systems and legacy users. <laughs> I will let you all make whatever inferences you want about that. Corey, you look like you wanted to jump in on this. Well, there were just two things, and one of them we had talked about in the breakout, but I think it's worth sharing. Nearly every educator that comes into Second Life, the first time they hold a class in Second Life, what do they do? They build a classroom. Right. They build a classroom with walls and desks and chairs and a blackboard and a roof yeah. in a world where you can fly. <laughs> and, and then they learn that it's really inconvenient to, to get there because you, you fly into the roof and you bounce off the roof and then you fall down and you have to walk in the door. So then they do the second version, which is still desks, chairs, blackboard, podium, but usually fewer walls and no roof. And then at some point it kind of hits them that we're so used to operating with this artifact of the real world where that's sort of a convenient orienting geometry. Well, what happens if we don't need to do that? And then suddenly you see this just explosion of classroom forms very much tied to what they're trying to teach, which shouldn't surprise us, right? The classroom itself should be an artifact of what you're trying to teach. So that, that was the first thing. The second thing, um, I don't know whether it's a generational issue or not, but I think it's, it's very easy to make assumptions about Second Life's demographics that, that may or may not support that. Um, so Second Life is relatively gender balanced and as many users are older than 35 than, than under 35. But I think maybe more interesting is monotonically in increasing from age of about 13 to age 80 plus. The older you are when you first encounter Second Life, the more likely you are to keep using it and the more you use it on an hourly basis. Now, way more young teens and 30-somethings are exposed to Second Life. And we can talk, I mean, there are lots of reasons for selection bias there. But if they are exposed to it, the older you are, the more likely you are to keep using it. And you will then use it more. And the second one is that at any given age, women are more likely to keep using it and use it more on a per capita basis than men. And so I don't know what that means. I think it's worthy of study, though, so get out there and study it. Yeah, we're all going to get a lot of grants. Can I, Anne? can I pick up on that? I want to pick up with your phrase, the artifact of the real world, because I think that's actually a, po a point of contention we should be thinking about. I teach art history. There is no visual digital substitute for the thing itself and that moment of interaction with the thing itself. I mean, there, there is no, I mean, there can be, maybe I should say there's a substitute, but it is not the same thing as the thing itself. And even with artists that work with digital media, they're usually producing works. For those of you in the audience who were here in Cleveland when MOCA had its digital technology exhibition, you know this to be true, that they were producing, those artists were producing works of art that were intentionally experiential and experiential in 3D time and space with our bodies here and now. So I think that, again, there's points of education that, that to me escape second life. They can be substituted, but the thing itself, the artifact of the real, cannot be substituted in certain cases. And I, th and I think, if I can pick up on a point that Phil made, where you talked about as people's research and teaching come together, you'll see an increase of this use, if that's pointing to the future. What do we do with disciplines where that divide may actually be increasing? That is, I just did a survey in our humanities center. I can tell you our humanities faculty are using technology very heavily in their teaching practice, far less so in their research practice. They access databases, but they're not using it in a generative or creative capacity in that sense. They're using it to gain access. So, you know, I, I'm just sort of pushing at some of these points um, to say that you know, these may not be things that, you know, fit everyone all at the same time everywhere. Well, let me turn to you. So, As a physicist, I mean, the, the, the take on physicists and, and people in, in deep science, if you will, was absolute use of technology as a research tool and virtually no technology as an instructional tool for a long period mm -hmm. of time. Now, you're now in a different role, fellow as you are the Physi American Physical Association, as an advocate for undergraduate education here at Case. 
Talk a bit about that crossover in terms of your own path and what that, what that suggests maybe for others. You, you Conscious of Anne's comment. You, you mean the use of technology? The use of technology. Uh, it has, I mean, it has uh, increased dramatically. Mm -hmm. I mean, partly because of the, uh, people have discovered the value of, say, you know, simply things like simulations. To give, you know, the value of experiential learning has been emphasized, but you know, you can't, um, especially with given the numbers of classes, in especially some classes, you can't really have uh, direct experiential learning, but the simulations have turned out to be a fairly useful substitute for those things. Are they becoming a useful platform also to foster collaboration? Yes, yes, okay. absolutely. And so, I mean, the technology is being used. I'm not sure, I don't have any numbers as to how extensively it's been used. A lot of technology is being used, you know, interactively, you know, to get immediate feedback from classes about what, uh, what the understanding of things is, you know, the clickers and all these kinds of things. Uh, but I think the, you know, the, as I said, the most interesting thing in education is the bottom-up thing, that the students are taking charge mm -hmm. of a lot of these things and using these things to form networks and learn things together on their own. And we have to learn really how best we can help them and facilitate that process because ultimately, you know, learning is something that people do on their own. It's not something that's imposed on them by the teacher. And if we can learn to better utilize these technologies to get students together around questions that interest them and learn how to investigate it together and share ideas, then I think we'll be really taking advantage yeah. of the maximum potential. Of this. One of the interesting ironies is those, that first generation of students, and, and several of you talked about generation, but those first generation of st undergraduates who got microcomputers, IBM PCs and Macs, in the mid-1980s today are middle-aged, early middle-aged, mid-career academics. They are no longer 18, 20, they are now late 30s and 40s. You can make an argument to say that the way the campus, because campuses went into this not because of reselling computers to make money, but it was, again, the power and the potential of the technology. Uh, Corey's point is well taken. People go into Second Life, they build a virtual world, which is the one that they've left in, in a building across the way. For many of those students in that early phase, who are now you know, essentially early middle-aged academics who stayed, you know, who succumbed to the vortex of both the technology and academe, um, they could argue that the periphery has changed dramatically in terms of the resources. The core activity in the classroom is still, as several of you have noted, hasn't changed. Phil, well, you deal I, with this a lot. Well, yeah, but I think there's an interesting uh, transition that's going on, and it's a recognition, and Mano kind of, I think, uh, uh, highlighted this, courses are no longer discrete units in time. I mean, the, the whole idea of a course being something that lasts for 15 weeks and you come into it and you think about this topic for 15 weeks and then, and then, you th and then it's gone uh, and you do something else for the next 15 weeks is increasingly challenged by the kind of technologies that we have. In fact, courses are experiences and the experiences build on each other. And the remarkable thing is that this is allowing us to have people who were in our classes five or six years ago come back into our classes and in some sense mentor or engage with the students who are going through this at an earlier stage in their thinking and set up this intergenerational discussion, um, at least in, in the context of generations when, in terms of undergraduate years. Um, and this notion is really challenging a lot of our, our, our infrastructure from an organizational and administrative sense. What does it mean now to have a course that is um, partly inhabited by or which involves uh, students, if you will, that are half of them paying from this particular term and half of them visiting from some other time in the, in the past or, or just dropping in because it's open and available on the web. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think it's, it's an extremely powerful and grassroots change, which has the potential to allow this kind of in investigation and allow this kind of engagement to, um, to, uh, to present an opportunity for anybody with the interest and the ability and the idea to actually make a, a contribution both to the discipline as well as to individuals' lives and, and betterment. I do also want to follow up on the, on the notion that um, that the, uh, this, this demo democratic access uh, is incredibly powerful. I mean, there's just today in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the news, there was an announcement of a, of a woman from Cuba who got a, an award for, um, uh, for, for digital democracy and, uh, and blogging, uh, who couldn't attend the award ceremony in Spain because she wasn't allowed to leave Cuba uh, to do so. She's been blogging for 18 months and just blogging about her life and has really changed um, her peer group, mid-30s uh, professionals in, in that country, and you can see what the power of just the ability to communicate can afford, can offer when the affordance is available. And that is, I think, really a true issue about, about the access being available to, to anybody. 
the last point I, I'll, I'll get to is it's really interesting to me uh, your comments about the, the interaction with the real thing versus a facsimile of it. Because I, there, are, there are times when I'm not sure I know what that real thing is. I and can tell you, if, <laughs> if the museum was open, I'd walk you across the street well, and no, say, I understand the emotional, yeah. the emotion, and, 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 the, and, the, and, the, and the notion of presence and all of that. But in the last conversation in the breakout, I know we had this, I was over, overhearing the discussion that um, those are constructs that we bring to our interactions. And one of the challenges that this technology is affording us is to really rethink um, how those constructs are built and what they mean about our identity and our relation to things. And so it's, a, it's an interesting juxtaposition. Right. And I wasn't really pointing to, I mean, I think there is, of course, the emotional reaction. But I'm really talking about it as an analytical tool. I mean, I can simply not register digitally the layers of paint in a Turner painting that I, that I can when I can physically see it. It's just there's not the capacity. I can get it as an aggregate, right? I can get multiple views that as an aggregate can give me the information over time with x-rays and other technologies. So there's an enhancement. But that's what I'm saying. It's not the same thing as that moment where, because of the way our mind works, we can actually grasp that in that capacity differently than we get through the aggregate. So I think, yes, the digital has a potential of gathering information in a new way, but it's not the same thing as that moment of, of grasping. We're, we're, we're sort of hitting a point where we're going from this power and potential to some of the, the pitfalls and the dangers, which is actually where I wanted to go anyhow. So thank you for getting us there. And Anne, let me, let me turn to you. You've talked about the actual and the real, you know, and that applies as much to art history as it might as, as to a wet lab or a physics lab. How, you know, how far and how long and how well will the simulation or the digital representation yeah. take you? What are some of the other things that we need to be conscious of in, in our efforts to make this movement, whether in terms of collaboration technologies and tapping, in, in terms of these reach and grasp issues, keeping them in alignment, keeping in focus, and setting realistic goals for what we hope to do? Well, I can just say that um, from my own personal experience, um, I feel like there's a pretty big gap between promise and, 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 and actuality. Um, I have a project that was a wiki-based project that I consider a failure. And that failure was largely through infrastructure and, and knowledge. And, and so I can just, again, speaking from my experience in the humanities, there's not a whole lot of knowledge in our faculty community about how to use these tools and things. And so this project wasn't, didn't deliver what I thought it would deliver, despite I did make availance of our Friedman Center activities here and had some external funding. But I, don't, I didn't have enough external funding to do the work I wanted to do. I think issue number two, um, and, and then I'll turn it over to, to Corey. Um, you know, there is a lot of funding in the humanities for digital projects. NEH is doing a big drive for this ACLS. But all of them require that whatever results you produce are open source, which goes back to democracy. Wonderful. OK, let's talk about tenure and promotion policies. What's my incentive to produce a database to support the study of the London art market and make that immediately accessible to everyone when I, if I want to get my next promotion, need to you know, write an article that's unique contribution to scholarship? So I think there's a little bit of tension there that we need to be thinking about. Um, frankly, my colleagues and I working on this project are thinking about not pursuing external funding so we can produce proprietary information for a three to five year period where we can use it exclusively for ourselves. And then after five years, we're happy to release it once we've been able to publish and make the next benchmark in the way academia is set up in the incentive process. Michael, I noticed you were nodding when Ann referred to knowledge and infrastructure. As a president, Mm -hmm. My guess is that you deal with that a lot in terms of people want more of, of the infrastructure and you wish they had more of the knowledge. <laughs> it's interesting. That I, I think you, you, you hit the nail on the head there. I, I, was, thinking about, I was thinking about what I, what I think are, are great pitfalls. And I always think that, that one of the great pitfalls is that we fetishize technology because technology isn't a thing. Mm -hmm. It's many different kinds of thing. Uh, and it's not about, in, in my view, it's never, uh, at least in our business, about technology, except, of course, if you, if you think technology extends what human beings do. And in that case, the focus is on what do human beings do in our context, in our particular space, that helps them learn better, more effectively. And in, in fact, one of the great challenges of our age is to figure out what you can do in a physical space that you can't do elsewhere, which is one of the mm -hmm. questions you, you were touching upon. Mm -hmm. Interesting thing about, about that, I guess, is, is you know, a, a much more low to the ground, pragmatic concern is that um, 
you can get infrastructure just radically wrong. Mm -hmm. You can make really expensive in, in, in investments and they say, oh, you know, we really didn't want to invest in, education, in that Plato system. And we in advertise the way you can in Second Life yeah. in terms of yeah. take it down and put it back up. We're, I'm yeah. getting signals that we're, and we're conscious of the clock. So I want to give uh, mm -hmm. Corey, Lano, and Phil a last chance as well, whether it's knowledge and infrastructure or some other issues we need to come back to in terms of setting realistic expectations for the potential of this technology in collaborative and other kinds of ways. Corey? I think it's, it, there have been a couple of really interesting statements, just the, in terms of the, the order in which things are said, like what can we do in a physical space that we can't do elsewhere, where of course I think it's just in some ways just as interesting to ask the, the converse of that question. Um, I think we need to be careful about dogma. And, you know, if you look at communication technology throughout the ages, as every technology has been introduced, there's been this, this cut, which is, okay, well, it allows this kind of communication, and that's real, but it doesn't allow this. This can all, only still happen in the real world. And then a decade or two later, some other technology comes along, and we change that line. Now, I don't think anybody's going to argue, this isn't Jaron Lanier sitting up here in 1995 saying we're all going to live in our pods with our haptic devices and never do face-to-face -face stuff. That, that's nonsensical. Um, clearly, the bandwidth of communication face-to-face, -face, the bandwidth of our senses face-to-face -face is so much greater. But just as clearly, there are a host of interactions that are just as real, whether they're mediated through a virtual world, the telephone, or whatever. Um, I think in thinking about you know, the sort of the, the, the cautionary notes going forward is we need to be very aware of where dogma enters our thinking on both sides of this. You know, having been on the practitioner side of building this thing and now being at, at Annenberg, it's striking how little research we really have mm -hmm. into questions mm -hmm. like transfer, into questions like what are the impacts of growing up with this technology. We just don't know yet. You know, you read papers about you know, in individual cases of somebody who's a guild leader in a virtual world and is now a vice president somewhere, and the reason they're a good VP is because they were a guild leader. Well, okay, that's, that's a great story, but there might be some correlation causation questions there that are worth investigating. And given now that millions of people have been involved in virtual worlds and games and have then entered the workforce or entered academia, I bet the sample set is now large enough that we could ask good questions there. Um, and then I, I think the, the, the last two, uh, one, I think we are at the same time often guilty of radically underestimating and then overestimating technological adoption and competence among people younger than ourselves. Mm -hmm. uh, Mimi Ito in particular has been doing a lot of research recently that keeps sort of surfacing again and again that, you know what, the, the generation coming up really isn't all that much more technologically capable and it certainly isn't as widespread as, as sometimes we feel because we didn't grow up with it and we had to go to learn all this stuff. And, and then finally, um, if you're involved anywhere in this space and you have any opportunity to talk about net neutrality, you should. Of all the things that could demolish everything that we're talking about here, um, taking away our ability to move bits around uh, is probably the biggest. I'm sorry, I just want to say one thing really fast. When I say generational shift, I'm thinking about it in a Kuhnian sense, not in an age sense. Mm. That is, what, what, that means. What, what, what Kuhn basically says in, 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 in par with paradigm shifts mm -hmm. is that part of what happens is, is you know, real science mm -hmm. stops, stops answering, uh, answering questions, and when you really get the shift is, mm -hmm. is somebody who's internalized right. a different paradigm. So right. that's not about technology expertise. No, you could argue in one sense that the, 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 part -time, the administrative assistant going part-time for a tech course at community college may have higher expectations about technology resources than a full-time undergraduate in a residential institution. Mm -hmm. Mono, to you, what else do we need to consider in terms of reach and grasp issues as we come to a close? Well, one thing, as Corey pointed out, I mean, universities are pretty good when it comes to adopt, uh, adopting these technologies early. But we have a sort of split personality. We adopt these early because the, we want to attract students, and students are attracted to all these communication uh, interactive uh, systems, and we uh, hire them. But as Anne points out, when it comes to the faculty, our evaluation and structures are still mm -hmm. very traditional. So we have these students doing all these wonderful things, but the faculty are not encouraged to really explore these things as well as they can. We so need to expand the algorithm for review and promotion. Sure, that's why they build classrooms with the walls and the ceiling, because that's uh, the framework that they are evaluated in. And so we have to think about, and secondly, the question of the knowledge, the ownership of the knowledge. We are rewarded for creating proprietary knowledge and doing little things in our own particular way so that this is mine, you know, I authored it, and so on. The idea of knowledge as a sort of a general thing that's accessible to everybody and we create knowledge and disseminate it widely, 
the university hasn't quite yet come to terms with how to deal with that in, for its faculty. So it's, it's a split thing between what we do for the students and what we do for faculty, and we have to think about bridging those two together. Uh, and, and Phil, because you're from MIT, you're going to get the great opportunity to give us the, the closing grand synthesis <laughs> on all this. You know. Well, I, the only thing I want to... Give us the delivered knowledge from Cambridge. The, the, what <laughs> What I'd Where like all delivered to, knowledge comes from, right? Right, right. What I'd like to, uh, to, to end up with is, I mean, there was a session earlier today on the, on the program entitled The People Formerly Known as the Audience, mm -hmm. and, which I thought was, was quite clever. In the higher ed context of what we're discussing here, it's, it's really that uh, it's the, uh, the, collaborator, the collaborators and co-creators formerly known as students. Um, what we really are, are engaging in here is an opportunity to have a collective process by which we explore ideas and, and switching these roles is one of the things that the technology gives us an opportunity to do, but it doesn't give us a whole lot of guidance on how to do it. And so in that sense, I think our challenge is a whole lot less about the technology and a whole lot more about our ability to be creative and to think outside the boxes that we've created for ourselves. Which occurred from the moment the first personal computer walked onto a campus in one sense. It's just continuing. Great, thank you. Um, I want to thank the panel, Ann Hanlick, Phil Long, uh, Corey Ordak, am I, I'm going to, it's, uh, my apologies, Corey, Michael Shoup, and Mano Singham, and I want to thank the audience as well, and I want to thank Case for giving us this opportunity. The day, the panel's gone fast, and the day has gone fast. Um, as is sometimes said in other contexts, we all hope we, that it has been good for you too. Thank you. <laughs>